It was a sunny summer day in Sarajevo on June 28, 1914. The birds were chirping, people were going on about their business as usual and the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand decided to drive down the streets of the city with his dear wife as to open up the new Imperial State Museum in their newly acquired territory of Bosnia from the Ottomans. While on the route through the enchanting ex-Ottoman city, several Serbian extremists attempted to assassinate them by throwing early 20th century homemade equivalents of pipe bombs at their convoy that only ended up injuring two of their guards. Upon visiting their loyal fallen soldiers in the hospital, the car carrying the royal family took a wrong turn on the street where a supreme gentleman was enjoying his morning coffee at a local cafe. Upon noticing the two, All hell broke loose. <laughs> Upon the killing of Austria-Hungary's heir to the throne, the Austrian government was outraged and immediately arrested the assassins that organized the attack on their statesmen. The government arrested 25 suspects. All were Austro-Hungarian citizens except for three, one of them being Gavrilo Princip, who had shot Ferdinand. During the investigation it was concluded that the assassins were supplied and funded by the secret Serbian military organization, the Black Hand, whose primary objective was unifying all South Slavic lands under Serbia. Due to Franz Ferdinand being a popular federalist, who aimed to incorporate the South Slavic lands into the Austro-Hungarian Empire as a third constituent monarchy, the Black Hand saw him as an enormous threat to their aspirations and thus decided to eliminate him off of the political chessboard in an attempt to further their interests and release Bosnia from the grasps of a foreign empire. The Austrian government intended to find links between the assassins and the Serbian government within the Kingdom of Serbia as to have a casus belli on invading the neighboring kingdom and seizing their lands. However, the investigation concluded that there was no substantiating evidence to support this claim, as evidence determined that the Serbian government was aware of the group's existence. However, it had no ties to the Black Hand whatsoever. Yet, this wasn't enough to appease the Austrian government. Still, driven with a desire to annex the South Slavic Kingdom, the Austrian government started to prepare for war and consolidated ties with their allies in preparation. As a way of obtaining a justifiable war cause, Austria and Hungary delivered Serbia a 10-point ultimatum, which they knew the kingdom could never accept. Serbia, to the surprise of many, accepted all points except number 6, and even offered a compromising solution to the point, where instead of either of the two countries trying to investigate the incident, have instead the trial and investigation take place in The Hague and be done by the superpowers of the world. All countries within Europe and even Germany thought that Serbia's answer was adequate. However, Austria had no intent on accepting it. And thus, on July 28, 1914, the day Austria rejected Serbia's answer, Europe was plunged into chaos. The war began with an Austro-Hungarian shelling campaign against Belgrade. Austrian ships sailed down the Danube and started shelling the mighty Belgrade fortress standing on top of the city as rifle fire roared across the Sava River. For the next week, bullets were flying across the river that divided Austria-Hungary and Serbia as TNT blasts demolished the bridges that had previously connected the two. On the 12th of August, the Austrians finally decided to invade as the second Austro-Hungarian army imposed pressure along the Sava River. The 5th Army commenced a penetrative attack crossing the river Drina into the western part of Serbia. Seeing this, the Serbian army had to adjust their plan of defending the country and rearrange their troops' positions and sent out their 2nd Army, which was their main force to attack the enemy's attacking army's left flank. Thus, on 15th of August, the 2nd Serbian army traveled westwards and occupied a defensive position on the mountain of Cer near the village of Tekeris, as they were expecting the Austrian army to attack from there. The next day the two armies commenced in a bloody battle that would define the war. Artillery roaring, soldiers shouting, rifles shooting, planes flying overhead, it was a mess. However, after nine days of hard battle, the Serbian army was able to successfully repel the invading Austro-Hungarian army with a decisive defeat, as the 5th Austrian army suffered around 40,000 casualties Meanwhile, Serbia suffered only 18,000. But there was no time to celebrate. 
World War I was in full blaze and the Central Powers were making great advances in the Eastern and Western fronts. Serbia might have won the battle but hadn't won the war. Thus Serbia went on the offensive and decided to invade the Hungarian provinces of Srem across the Sava River. Unexpected to many, the underdog of the Great War was able to occupy a decent chunk of the province and reinforce their defensive positions. Still, the Imperial Army wasn't just going to sit and do nothing about that. They were determined to conquer the Slavic Kingdom. And by God, they were going to do it. Thus, on September the 8th, the Austro-Hungarian army launched a second offensive into Serbia, once more across the Drina and Sava rivers. Because of this, the Serbian army was forced to abandon its positions in Srem as it rushed to reinforce its western front. Again, unanticipated by the Austrians, the Serbians were able to repel their advances, thus the front evolved into trench warfare. During this time period, warfare were similar to the ongoing one in France and Belgium. But during this time period, many fiddlers were sent to raise morale of the army within the trenches. Often enough, they would start playing their fiddles during a battle, and as they'd sing louder and louder, fire on both sides would gradually go down, until both sides would stop shooting at each other and listen to the musical performance. Upon the fiddler ending his piece, he'd pick up a gun, shoot it at the enemy, and the battle would continue. Yeehaw! With the second offensive devolving into stagnation, the Austro-Hungarian army prepared for a third offensive. Over the months of trench warfare, the empire decided to replenish its resources and rest up its army. Thus, on November 6th, the imperial army was on the attack again. A barrage of artillery shells started hitting Serbian positions in much greater numbers than they had experienced before. This proved to be extremely difficult for the Serbian army to handle as their resources were slowly depleting and they didn't have the means to return fire. Thus, finally, after five months of trying to invade a country, the Austro-Hungarian Empire penetrated the Drina and took over major territories in western Serbia alongside the cities of Valjevo and Lajkovac. Overwhelmed with the superior firepower of the Austrians and lack of ammunition and shells on their side, the Serbian army was forced to retreat from Belgrade. Therefore, in December the 3rd, Belgrade finally fell under the grasp of Austria-Hungary. But Serbia wasn't out of the fight yet. The same day Belgrade fell into the hands of the Imperial Army, the first Serbian army was preparing for a counter-attack. Allied supplies had finally reached Serbia from Greece, and it was time to use them. The Serbian army positioned themselves on the right side of the Kolubara River, near the town of Gornji Milanovac, where they fortified their positions. The Austrians, thinking they have the Serbs pushed into a corner, unable to defend themselves from the might of the Imperial Wehrmacht, didn't expect the Serbs to unleash a barrage of artillery and engage the army with full force, piercing through the Austro-Hungarian front, which would then devolve into chaos as its army waveringly collapsed with a staggering counter-offensive. Within two days, the battle would be over as the Serbian army devastated the Imperial army, capturing over 323 officers and over 42,000 non-commissioned officers and even more ammunition and equipment. On the 15th of December, the Serbian army would go on to liberate Belgrade, only two days after the Austrians held a military parade within the city, prematurely celebrating Serbia's capitulation. Although Serbia once more was successful in preventing the Austrian advances, the war was just starting for the small Balkan country. Over the next year, the Austrian forces would replenish and ask for help from their ally Germany, as well as start planning to incorporate Bulgaria into their alliance. Finally, the fourth offensive began on October 16, 1915, as the Austro-Hungarian and German forces focused all their strength in a ferocious push on Belgrade. Serbian forces threw themselves at the enemy, trying to stop the Central Powers' advance at any cost. Despite their bravery and battle fervor, the united forces of Austria, Hungary and Germany were too much to handle, and Belgrade fell under enemy hands. At the same time as the Serbian army was struggling to repel the invasion to its north, Bulgaria invaded Serbia on its eastern side, and in a weakened state, pushed all the way to Skopje, cutting off Serbia's connection to Greece and the rest of the Allies. As the progression of the invasion continued, 
more and more of Serbia fell under enemy occupation as Bulgaria continued to push and occupy the entirety of eastern and southern Serbia and Austria-Hungary taking over the entirety of western Serbia. On November the 25th, the Supreme Serbian Command decided that the army had no other option but to retreat south through Albania and reorganize and join the Allied forces in the Greek island of Corfu. Thus began the event known in Serbian history as the Albanian Golgotha where over 150,000 soldiers marched through the mountains in Albania accompanied alongside their king and regent, as the central power forces were right on their trail chasing them down. Alongside the military, many Serbian civilians and academics joined their ranks as a sign of patriotism, marching by their side through the winter. Over the upcoming months, over 70,000 Serbians died on the march due to hunger and overexhaustion. After a month of marching through hostile terrain, the Serbian army finally reached the coast of Albania, where the Allied Navy transported the soldiers to Corfu. The exhausted, starving and sick soldiers finally reached the island, but although they were safe at last, many were severely ill, and in the first days of them reaching Corfu, it is estimated around 120 Serbian soldiers died per day, because of which many named Corfu the island of death. However, the soldiers soon enough regained their strength, upon which throughout May and April of 1916, they started to be transported to Thessaloniki, where they joined the main allied forces. Together, they commenced a counterattack on Bulgaria and started regaining territory from the Bulgarian occupiers. Throughout 1917, the front didn't change much. The real changes in the war situation came in 1918, after the US joined the war. As the Western Front started making gains, the Thessaloniki Front was successful in breaking through Bulgarian defenses, upon which the Serbian army continued to march north and liberate the occupied provinces of Macedonia. Finally, Bulgaria signed a peace treaty on September 29th. Throughout the month of October, the Serbian army continued to press north and engage German soldiers who occupied major cities, kicking them out of the country and pressing even into the territories of Austria-Hungary. Finally, the war was put to an end for Serbia on November 13, 1918, as the country signed the final peace treaty with Hungary. After the war, Serbia would go on to exchange territories with its neighboring countries, most notably Hungary and Romania as well as form the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, which would later on be renamed to the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Over the four year period, it is estimated that Serbia lost almost one third of its population and 62% of its male population. Over the upcoming years, the Kingdom was tasked with undergoing massive restoration efforts as so much of its industry and infrastructure were destroyed during the conflict. And yeah, that would be the story of Serbia during World War I. I hope you learned something and gained perspective into one of the lesser known stories of the Great War. If you enjoy my content and wish to help me make more great videos, click that subscribe button. And if you really enjoy my stuff, become a member today, like these wonderful people. Craig Zeeves, Mickey D, Pavan, Anthony YouTube, Roland S, Nequa, Emmanuel Donchilo, Andrei Sorin Parskiv, Poodle Raz, Rember Lads, Jozef Borat, PC Chan, Seal King, Baduvu, Vangelis Gru, Adam Cube, Matej Radu, Raj, Exalted, TD45, Berker1237, Kaza, Jamai Moment 1, and Laszlo Dula Urmeshi. My name is Janos, and you've watched Living Ironically in Europe. <laughs> Samo ne moješ da ti, kada počneš vreći.